What's going on, guys? So welcome to the podcast with S2 Underground. I want to be up front with you guys and let you know we had a couple of technical difficulties just up front starting off, but when we cut in, it's going to be at the very early onset of the conversation, so you didn't really miss much, maybe five minutes or so. If you haven't heard of S2 Underground, these guys are really amazing. It's an aggregate of intelligence analysts, and they are really serious about the news. They give you deep dives and analysis on things. Uh, like they say, they don't always come out with breaking news. If you want breaking news, you follow me on Instagram. Watch my story. It's all nothing but breaking news and relevant news. But if you want deep dive analysis on current world events, check them out. Now, also, they have a podcast here on YouTube, S2 Underground. Type it in the search bar. It'll bring you right to there. How to freaking camouflage yourself from drones, how to hide people, escape and evasion that these guys, obviously, they went through Syria and all that. So, you know, they don't like disclose anything, but they disclose what you need to know. It's really, really a great channel. I can't recommend that resource for you enough. All right, guys. So like I said, we have some technical difficulties. So enjoy this little bit of music, and it's going to bring you right into about five minutes into our conversation, and the rest is on here for you. All right, stand by. I know you guys are going to enjoy. Cheers. Catch you at the end of the city, I of the darkness came a man Dressed in a dark green battle jacket With a carbine in his hand He came to organize the people Told them do not be afraid It's, it's really, it's been educational for me And I find, uh, I kind of have a hard time these days Finding stuff that will really educate me That doesn't, it's not very basic But you guys, I mean, you guys are on a different level over there I think that's probably comes from you know, experience as well as extensive research that you all do. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something that we have, uh, we've leveraged our, you know, combined, I think we've got probably two or three decades worth of federal Intel stuff and then state Intel stuff and, uh, you know, contracting and things like that. So we've, we're using our skills, you know, in the best way that we can to, you know, give back to you know, people in the best way that we can. And which, which in this case is, you know, educationally and, uh, well, really lately has been providing platforms for people who have been kind of deplatformed. So, um, yeah, and you guys have been deplatformed pretty hard. Um, we were talking, kind of laughing together, actually, right before the program started. Yeah. This is this is coming on the um, January eleventh, twenty twenty one. Yep, twenty twenty one already, man. It's crazy. Can you believe it's twenty twenty one? Yeah, it, it does not seem like it already. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But anyway, it's twenty twenty one, January eleventh. Yesterday. Uh, Parler was deplatformed just completely by Amazon. Yep. You guys had a huge following on Instagram, and then until they decided just to delete your account with no explanation given. Yep. Yeah, okay. we're on our fourth Instagram account, I think. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's fourth Instagram, and um, that's something I got to talk to you a little more about, actually, because yeah. I guarantee you they're going to cut me off any day here now. Um, I'm already yeah. being shadow banned right now, and this yeah, comes after. Yeah you know, like them wanting to delete my, threatening to delete my shit for like, you know, two, three strikes now, and then cutting me off from live video, all of it. So yeah. what are we, what are we really looking at here, Jay? I mean, it's not just guys like you and me either. No, it's, it's really, we're starting to see really the power of people are really saying big tech, but it's really just the math and the algorithms behind it. Mm. We're starting to see a lot of people that are, we're starting to see not necessarily people being silenced because they are either of a certain political ideology, but because they either have a voice or they point something out or they engage in a certain way that flags a certain algorithm. So then they get banned. That's why you're starting, that's why you're seeing, or rather not seeing a lot of very prominent conservative, conservative like leadership and politicians get the boot. But other everyday people log in and say, hey, my Facebook account got banned for something that I never did. So it's kind of a strange thing to explain. I don't think anybody's really got a good explanation for exactly how it works. Um, yeah, but yeah was, it's definitely a problem. It's a huge problem. And I was online last night and tonight trying to figure out, hey, how do you get off a shadow ban? Like, how do you do? But it's all it's a lot of it, at least it's algorithms. It's not like there's some nerd sitting behind the screen saying you're banned. It's yeah. all a machine, right? 
Yeah, it's ab- absolutely. In very few cases are we seeing deliberate people being targeted. And, and if, you know, that's happening, it's, it's going to be like high profile targets, right? It's not going to be people like, you know, you and me who have no real reason to be banned. It's going to be like higher ranking people. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we're going to see a lot more of, especially considering the, you know, the web of things, how everything is interconnected, how people have they're going to have like a google account or something and they get their banking information through that well now the google knows about where they bank and they can subpoena that information or they can you know leverage banks we've seen that before we're probably going to see it again just to you know we could go down that rabbit hole all day with different things that can be done didn't they recently actually it used to be like if you take out 999 what is it? $9,099 or something like you, you don't set off the flag, but didn't they just recently lower it to like an insane amount? So I'm not entirely sure exactly about that, but suffice it to say uh, there, there are of course limits, right? This has been a thing since electronic banking was a thing. And this is from not necessarily from big tech, but from the government side of things, people like at Homeland and your big three letter agencies, they want to make sure that people aren't moving money around and laundering it in certain ways. And for a long time, people were under the impression that, Hey, there's this magic $10,000 limit for, Hey, if I spend or move around or commit a, some kind of electronic bank transfer for less than that, I'm not going to get caught. Well, it's not necessarily like that. Uh, These, these agencies have gotten really, really good at tracking the bad guys, the legit bad guys. And if legit bad guys can figure this out, then, you know, normal Americans don't really have a chance at avoiding it. Mm. So, you know, we, we saw it with, I think, what was it? A Bank of American Citibank trying to tell people that they can't buy firearms with their credit card. Wow. And that was like two years ago. I'm not even really sure how that turned out, but I would expect stuff like that to come back and impact, you know, mainstream America like us. Yeah. So, that's crazy. I'm waiting for the day where we see, what are they called? Wallas or Walla Wallas here in uh, the States with a middleman moving money around and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hawala networks. Yeah. Just yeah, some yeah. dude carrying a bag of cash. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, it works for the bad guys. And unfortunately I think a lot of American, you know, average citizens are going to have to resort to that too. Shad is, uh, actual says, get some junk silver. That's actually not a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, you know, it's not like we're, I mean, we're just shooting the shit here. We're not trying to, you know, move money or anything like that. But it's just fascinating talking about the algorithms, you know, how you can set it off and not even freaking mean to. And you're not even doing anything to begin with. But for whatever reason, it it can mess with your life. Yeah, it absolutely can. Um, I think that a lot of people... Or, or at least what we've been seeing for a while, uh, we ourselves were have been very wary of how our governmental systems can, can track and do these things. You know, the whole ever since the Snowden thing, every American citizen has been concerned with what their government can and cannot see. Well, one of the interesting paradoxes we're starting to discover now is that if a company were to come to you and say, hey, we're going to give you a free email service, but we're going to take from you every piece of data we could possibly get, every, th- every transaction you've ever made, every photo you take, every single part of your life, we say, hey, that's great. But if the government tries to do it or some kind of agency tries to do it, it's people balk at it, but they, people freely give their stuff away over to really big companies without actually knowing it. Yeah. So, and it's a big problem. Uh, big tech is becoming a big problem. And I hope I don't get banned yeah, for saying and it. Ha- it happens very quickly too. Yeah. Um, I think we've seen just how fast big tech has moved, even just with the example of, um, I can't remember who it was. Was I think it was either Twitter or uh, Apple or some, some, actually I think it was a Google Play Store where they said, hey, we're going to give you 24 hours parlor to uh, fix your stuff and ban either certain content or basically just agree to that you're going to police your content on your platform. And then they came back four hours later and said, Oh, JK, you only have like an hour left. And then they just said, screw it. We're just going to ban you anyway. (laughs) So it's uh, it's, dude, it's, it's been insane to be alive during these times. I mean, I don't know how old you are, but my generation has seen um, the birth of the internet, the birth of a cell phone, like all this technology, 9-11, freaking Iraq war, like 
this now. I'm sure, you know, national global pandemic. It's crazy yeah. to see how things have just accelerated to such a degree. Yeah, it really is. I, I think um, as of 2020 and really this year so far, I think a lot of people are going to have to change their priorities. People who weren't forced to think about these things like we have been, yeah, they're going to start to have to be, at least think about this stuff. So it's an interesting, uh, interesting challenge for moving forward. That's for sure. Well, you bring up a good point there, man, is that guys like you and I kind of, you could say forced, but you know, we, we are, we're forced to think about this stuff just yeah. due to, you know, the nature of who we are and what we do. Most right. people don't, and they never have thought about this stuff, you know, yeah. and it's, it really is forcing them to put it all in their face and deal with it. And I don't think a lot of civilians out there honestly have the capacity to be able to do that. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely a challenge. It, it really is. We have had our own little, you know, micro challenges along the way, and it's it's really been surprising the the sort of conspiratorial strength, uh, you know, hold that a lot of you know technology has over people's lives. Um, you know, ten years ago, if you said the stuff that we're saying now, you, if you said that ten years ago, you'd be crazy. But now. <laughs> It seems like, you know, we have to really plan for things that sort of sounds crazy now, right? We're looking years, years out from now. And the stuff that we're saying we have to be concerned with, you know, the internet not existing because Cloudflare and Amazon Web Services say that it doesn't want to happen. That kind of stuff we have to be concerned with now, or at least start thinking about it. Absolutely. And, you know, you saw guys like Alex Jones 10 years ago talking about this stuff. And yeah, it was entertaining. You thought, OK, like maybe there's some shred of truth in there. But the guy's clearly like conspiracy nut. Right. And then yeah, yeah. you go like flashback a year ago. Right. Today, even two years ago, you got like Sean Hannity talking about this stuff on mainstream news. You got like yeah. everyone kind of on the same page. Like this is where we are. Yeah, maybe it used to sound like a conspiracy, but it's not like this is legit. We're, let's talk about yeah. it now. It's crazy, man. Yeah, it's very it's very interesting to look back and see, you know, and of course then, you know, once we start looking into that stuff, we run into the trap of trying to find, well, this guy said this thing was going to happen, and he said at the same time this other thing was going to happen. So does that other thing going to happen now? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to say, but – yeah, it's it's definitely true that we have uh, we've not heeded a lot of warnings for a long time with you know the the power of things and the power of certain people in the world. So, you know, things look a lot less conspiratorial nowadays. Even though right now, you know, conspiracy theorists are having a field day with everything that's going on in the world. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a hard time to find good information now. So it really is. And and that's exactly why I wanted to have you guys on tonight or have you on yeah. as kind of the, the head boss over there is look, you guys are putting out great material, great content, and it's all relevant and it's all truthful. It's not most of what you guys put out is not hearsay and it's not, um, shall I say, we think this it's, it's the way that you put your news out there. I can tell an analyst put it out there. Yeah. And, and that's not something that's easy to do. And, and, you know, at the, at the risk of sort of patting ourselves on the back too much, we do have to realize that there's a trade-off. We, the reason that we don't really have a scheduled, you know, podcast that comes out at a specific date and time, we don't have a 24 hour news cycle. It's because the 24 hour news cycle, if you're wanting to get just the information, that's a, that's a modern construct. That's something that's manufactured. Some days nothing happens in the world and you just kind of got to live with it. Um, but sometimes you have to watch an event happen. You have to think about it. You have to realize what's going on. You have to research things. And by the time that people want to hear your opinion about things or by the time people want to, by the time that opinion actually gets out there or that analysis gets out there, it's already gone. It's been three days and nobody cares anymore. So um, we, we do have a, a good trade off of, Hey, the stuff we put out is, is going to be from an analytical perspective, but it's not going to be instant. We're not going to be replying to tweets 12 minutes after they happen. It's, it's going to take some time. Um, and you know, that's why, uh, that's why we're not so much a, a, a current events news station as we are an analytical one. So, no, absolutely. And if you guys want the current events, look, just 
check out my stories. I'm pretty current with my stuff. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, you've been putting out a lot of a lot of good stuff lately. So yeah. But if you want to deep dive on what's going on behind the scenes, check out S2 because they're very good at what they do. I want to get to a couple of the comments real quick so I don't leave anyone out. Um, yeah, sure. Flesh was saying he got uh, shadow banned <laughs> after making fun of China. I thought that yeah. that's pretty funny. Okay. Um, Sounds about right. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it does. It really does. Uh, let's see. So do y'all think we will see government control the wa withdrawal of money from the bank is near is in the near future? So I guess what he's asking is if, if they're going to try to do something like, uh, you know, no man could buy or sell save less. He had the mark, right? Right. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I would say, it's probably going to take a lot longer than if a bank wanted to do it. If a bank wants to do something, they could do it pretty quickly. Whereas the federal government, as much as you know, a lot of people are kind of scared at them, especially moving into 2021, they're still pretty bad at a lot of things. And there's a lot of people, a lot of powerful people that have to fight each other to get anything done. So I would say possibly, I mean, we've already seen it happen when it comes to things like per certain purchases. Um, it, it might happen one day, you know, very soon where you, all of your purchases are being flagged, right? So if you buy something at a sort of non-approved place from the, that the bank doesn't want to you spend spending money on, that could be an issue and they could, you know, do something to you. But once again, there, there's, there's, um, it's not like they're going to be able to do that and not get away with it. The right. way our current laws are, uh, court's going to see that at least, you know, for now. So well, if it were to happen, now, I would say, right? yeah, it's going to take a while. They can do that now, right? They just have to get kind of a FISA thing going or something, right? Yeah, if, if it's a national security type thing, um, yes. But then again, you know, your, your federal agencies are, are um, already strapped as is. So, right. you know, I would not be surprised if we saw legislation within this year to increase that sort of behavior and create an infrastructure to do it with a with a, with a snap of a finger or a push of a button, but who knows? You know? Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. I, I, I have a hard time believing some of people out there aren't already on that list and getting looked at whatever they buy anyway, but. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting thing. This, this notion of government watch lists and what that actually means. Well, you know, there's no one big list with everybody's name on it. Who's right. kind of in sort of enemy of the state for lack of a better term. It, there's a there's a bunch of different things that kind of go into it so and it's it varies by agency too so can you talk about that at all or well i mean i you know I, it's really not my field of expertise mostly domestic stuff but um i can say that say you're trying to buy a plane ticket and with you know cash money to a certain place well you know if it's a place like north korea you know somebody's obviously going to be watching that mm -hmm. um if you're trying to, especially if you're trying to transfer money, you know, the electronic bank transfer system is, is a huge part of that. So, mm. you know, one person taking a weekend trip to Dubai, nobody cares about. But if you're trying to, you know, make contact with like a North Korean regime or something like that in order to set up a, a tourist visa to their country, yeah, you're going to get looked at. And it's going to be probably by agencies we've never even heard of. Yeah. So, I'm glad they're out there, though, man, because frankly, like, you know, you can give the government grow up all you want, but they're, they're protecting our ass when it comes down to it, you know? Yeah. It's such a, it's such a difficult topic that we ourselves have had to kind of look at is that there's a lot of anti-government sentiment out there, which is perfectly legit. Like I get it. And then there's also the people that, you know, blindly trust a lot of these agencies. Yeah. And it's, we try to walk that line between the two saying, look, there's good stuff out there and there's bad stuff out there. We're going to shine light on the bad stuff and make sure it doesn't happen. And, you know, the good stuff that's happening out there, we're going to continue to try to do. Well, that's, you know, what we do. Um, but I can tell you, you know, the, the bad stuff sometimes outweighs the good stuff in a lot of cases. So sometimes yeah, you got really to do some bad predict. stuff to do some good stuff too, I think. Right. Yeah. And well, you know, that, that goes down a whole rabbit hole in and of itself too. I mean, it's, um, uh, from you know military side and civilian side and you know three letter agencies it's uh a lot of good stuff happens and a lot of bad stuff happens yes. um 
hopefully at the end of the day, the good stuff can outweigh the bad stuff. But, you know, as you can even see, that's kind of a flawed line of thinking, right? Yeah. So the, the fact that bad stuff happens at all is, is not good, but you know, it's, it's sort of the way it is and there's not a whole lot we can do to change it, but when stuff no, comes and I out, think that, I think you're right about that is it's just the way it is. And it's probably not going to change. Yeah. If nothing else, it's not going to change within a time frame that, would be acceptable. So, yeah. you know, stuff like when Snowden leaked what he did, um, you know, the world the, and really most citizens were kind of, you know, outraged that this was going on this entire time. So, you know, what he did did force to do a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Unfortunately, our adversaries look at what he did and say, oh, this is handy for us to know now. So let's go look at it and figure out how we can exploit it you know, at this, at the end of the day. So there's, there's two sides to every coin and there's uh two edges to every sword. Really. I'm really surprised Trump didn't uh, pardon Snowden. I would, you know, it would have made sense to get support, but at the end of the day, it, it kind of makes sense considering the people that are whispering in his ear Yeah. Um, from a national security perspective, it, you know, at the very top end of the food chain um, it's, it kind of makes sense that those people don't like what he did and the money that was cost and the yes. sort of black eye that the uh, NSA and the intelligence community got from that. It sort of makes sense that he didn't because, you know, why would he, he would have just gotten support from people he, who already supported him. So, right. Right. Um, but yeah, it would have been, it would have been nice to see, especially considering, you know, courts have said that he didn't really do anything wrong. So that doesn't matter. He cost us money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it, it, at the end of the day, it, it's all politics and, you know, yeah. we have to kind of expect politicians to do political things. So. Amen to that, man. It's, it's what, it's what it is. So Jake Shook yeah. says I had over 15,000 followers during the Virginia rally. I gave yeah. out all sorts of information about the protest and they banned him from Instagram and deleted his Facebook. He still yeah. can't make a Facebook. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, Virginia is a very uh, Virginia is a very interesting place, yes. especially when it comes to anything that goes against the status quo. I mean, you know, at this point in time, I think America is figuring out that you know somebody saying, "Hey, I politely disagree with you." Well, that's being labeled as extremism by a lot of people out there. Yeah, and you know, something is you know, I politely disagree with you. That's you know that's been extremist behavior for Virginia for a while, unfortunately. Well, let's jump into this because this is really yeah. the core meat and potatoes of what we're talking about here. And we'll get to yeah. you guys' questions uh, for sure, but I want to take the opportunity right now. Sure. So, you know, you bring up their mislab mislabeling people, um, extremists, right. terrorists. We saw the speech with SJ and I'm just going to refer to sleepy as SJ. I don't want to like, so yeah, oh. we saw, you know, SJ put out um, a few very divisive speeches. And yeah. in one of them, he was saying uh, all of this stuff about that, you know, this is about race and this is about if, you know, these white people wouldn't have been treated. And then he was saying all this stuff about um, these people are domestic terrorists. And that's not a, like a term you can throw around very lightly. So Correct, that really yeah. worried me when I heard that. Yeah, very, very serious stuff. So it's, it's fascinating from an Intel perspective because these are tactics that people like us and you know, people in government and in analytical agencies have been using for a very long time. So this is where that sort of you know, kernel of truth comes out when somebody like Alex Jones comes out and says, it's all a PSYOP, right? Well, there's a little bit of truth to that. These, these are certain tactics. You know, we all know how gaslighting works. You know, you do things to a person you make them question their own sanity by saying you know by either um convincing them that what they're doing they're not doing or by or by convincing them that they are doing behavior that you yourself are guilty of so it's it's a very interesting uh very interesting tactic that not just um, not just you know politicians on the left are using, but politicians on the right are using as well. But right now we're kind of really seeing it come from the left. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it's really missing its target a lot of times because you know 
we're, we're starting to see a lot of extremist groups on the left, on the political left of the spectrum, we're starting to see them, of course, fight extremism on the right. But the yeah. problem is, is that when you go so far to the edge of the political spectrum, you have a hard time identifying who's really the enemy. So when, when agencies on the left or when entities on the left try to target conservative or extreme right behavior, they end up just hitting middle America. They mm -hmm. hit centrists for people who, you know, like we said earlier in our uh, Keybase server, you know, you end up hitting Gary neck from next door instead of the actual like white supremacist or racist down the street. Like it's very interesting the way that it ends up shaking out because the power of information is, is truly something. Yeah. And, you know, speaking about the far right, like neo-Nazis, skinheads or whatever, like, yeah, You know, I grew up in New York, man. When I was like yeah. a kid, a kid, you would like see that type of like punk skinhead thing around. I don't see that stuff anymore, man. I mean, look, I get yeah, it it's out there, like, but I don't know how, like, to what degree it really is out there. Like maybe some people would like you to think. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And we have done a considerable amount of own, you know, like internal research trying to figure out that exact thing. Because when you call somebody, you know, a fascist or a Nazi or, or white supremacist or whatever, there's really no coming back from that. So the, the trick is, is that really behavior that's happening or is it not? And one of the things we found out is that, you know, this is kind of an obvious statement is, look, white supremacy and racism and the extreme, the, the extremists on the right, they've been around for kind of a long time. Yeah, a long time. And they've gotten really, really good at hiding their behavior, or if not just hiding it, changing it in such a way that it becomes more palatable. That's why you legitimately see at a lot of you know, conservative rallies, actual like white supremacists pretending to be people who favor liberty or something like that. Mm. That's of course not, not everybody. It's not even the majority. It's not even, it's just a tiny little bit. But it is interesting how that happens. Whereas extremists on the left, you're going to know who they are because they tell you. Yeah. Um, so conservative and or you know extremists on the far far right, they're not going to tell you they're an extremist until you, you know, you develop some kind of rapport because they have been sort of hunted by you know federal law enforcement agencies for a long time. You know, ask any politician, ask anybody on the National Security Council, they're going to tell you that the number one threat to America is homegrown, conservative, or alt-right extremism. Mm. They're not going to tell you it's something like 9-11 happening again. So that's so, really the biggest threat that we actually are facing is domestic homegrown, whether it's on the left or the right, but domestic homegrown stuff. I, I think it's kind of hard to say what our biggest threat is because the United States historically is pretty bad at this. Uh, we're very, we're pretty bad at seeing a major threat out there and acting on it early enough to know that it actually was a major threat. Like the indicators that were out there for 9-11 were around for years before. I mean, the building was bombed in 93. Yeah. So we, we can go, you know, using that as an example, but um it's hard to say if that is the biggest one, but absolutely, we were 100% convinced that uh, homegrown extremism from any political spectrum is definitely a major threat in today's society. So when we uh, see the news coverage of what happened out there in, um, you know, in Virginia, unfortunately, we see them trying to paint everyone there as a neo-Nazi, right? We see one guy right. with like a really crude racist shirt on and you know whatever they they try to paint everyone with the same brush right do you think that there were antipas in there do you think that it was only kind of who do you think that we can if any particular one group that could kind of get the blame for that so it's kind of that's kind of an interesting thought because one thing that that really a lot of people on both sides have been looking out for is the concept of a false flag attack which is something that is not really well known. Um, well, it really wasn't well known like five years ago. It's now sort of a mainstream thing. You've got somebody who said, who ha like you said, say there's some guy wearing a really racist shirt at a conservative rally. And they say, ah, the conservatives will say, ah, that guy was a false flag. He was really like Antifa or something. Mm -hmm. The other way around is the same. You'll see somebody wearing an Antifa shirt and breaking a window in Portland 
and the Antifa will say, no, 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 that guy was a false flag attack. And that's when we get into, we start getting into a rut of, well, we don't actually know. We can't actually figure this out unless we grab that guy, find out who he is and investigate further, which nobody's going to do. Um, we can't possibly know, was this guy really who he says he is or was he not? So it's very interesting to see because after every single event, especially things like the Capitol or um, the storming of the uh, Capitol in Michigan or any other Capitol situation or even Antifa rioting in you know, Portland or, or in New York up there where you're at, um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a hard thing to figure out what is actually happening because you've got videos and evidence from both sides saturating the market. And then you add in the false info on top of that and it's just a, a great big you know, recipe for misinformation out there. So I would, I would not doubt that there are people in every major event that happens, there are going to be people that show up that say they are something and they are something else entirely. Like that we've seen from as far as the capital is concerned, because that's everybody, what everybody's talking about now. We have a pretty good amount of evidence that does suggest that there were extremists on the left, I think mostly Antifa, who did masquerade, or at least they plan to masquerade as conservatives with the intention of doing harm. So, you know, whether or not that gets investigated, who knows, but we do have a little bit of evidence there. So, and, and it does make sense from a, you know, sort of tactical perspective. Yeah, it does. Uh, POQ wants to know, have you seen the 2A common sense legislation that's coming through? Um, I heard a little bit uh, about this, but not, not much. I haven't. I have seen that there have been a lot of gun control-esque legislation come out over the past couple of weeks, but I haven't seen anything specific. I, uh, wonder, I haven't really I hope delved into don't that. Don't misstep on that because that would be uh, that wouldn't be necessarily the smartest thing to do right now. You know? Yeah, it, it's we're starting to see a lot of people. Um, rather than trying to convince people of their ideology, just kind of force it down their throat. So, you know, some people just um, the hypocrisy with a lot of politicians and political leadership and things like that is kind of gets in the way of what they're actually trying to do. It would be best served to not gloat about things, you know, if they were trying to get something done. So, yeah, it. I have a whole lot of reservations about, you know, the next four years or so but yeah yeah um so trying to catch up with these questions here we're getting a lot of them so they yeah i figured uh let's see and if you see one jay that stands out to you just let me know i'm trying to get to everybody but there's a lot of chatter back and forth too so if i miss something uh yeah. feel free guys just to sound off again yeah i'm still watching um yeah, so I guess really the, the kind of the consensus here from what I'm seeing in the chat is that, um, you know, people are really confused. People don't really know what to make of what's going on here. It's frightening. Um, it should be frightening. And I think a yeah. lot of people just really want answers as to, hey, is it going to be okay? So yeah, we can't answer that. But in your educated opinion, I mean, what do we see coming down the pike here? So that's something that we have, we've kind of been tossing around in the shop here, trying to figure out how do we convey this? Because one of the things that we have from the very second we had an Instagram account until today, we've run into the issue of how do we accurately convey a threat or an assessment or something without either seeming like you're underselling it or you're overselling it. So what we think is, you know, is going to happen is we're going to go through some tough times. I think that's kind of obvious. Um, as far as specific events that are going to happen, I would, you know, we've had hours and hours of podcasts talking about, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see gun control be a huge thing. We're going to see um, a lot of federal, state, and local law enforcement stuff change. Um, from what it is to something else, either it be through social action um, or through governmental action. Um, we're going to see a lot of different stuff. It's kind of hard to sort of, sort of define, but 
you know, we can say, you know, one of the things we get asked a lot is, you know, I have no idea what's going on. I, I don't understand any of this. So you're kind of an expert. Tell me when to panic. Right. And we absolutely are saying it is not time to panic at yeah. all. Yeah. It's time to be concerned. I think 2020 and so far this year has shown us that, yeah, it's time to be concerned about certain things. Um, but considering of how many people out there in America are willing to do the right thing or at least be educated enough to do the right thing, you know, well, we're not, uh, we're not all, uh, you know, the time is nigh, right? You know, we're, the end is nigh. We're not, uh, we're not so uh, pessimistic as all that. But, um, yeah, we do think that a lot of things are going to happen in 2021, and they're probably going to upset a lot of different people. Yeah. So. No, I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. I definitely don't think it's time to panic, um, but it is time to raise an eyebrow. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay, we got uh, Shadez or Shade is actual on here again. He says, what policies yep. do you think are going to be implemented in the next year? And will all states follow those policies? Hmm. I would say there are most certainly going to be a lot of things passed. Um, I would say probably go to the presidential, uh, you know, the platforms of, hey, this is what we're going to pass the first hundred day plan. Um, I would say that's probably going to be pretty close. Um, I would say that stuff like that, if not that exact stuff, like, you know, mass gun control, mass uh, uh, agencies kind of going off the wire and doing their own sort of thing. That's going to be a, a thing, you know, throughout the year, not just the first hundred days. Um, I would, however, say that some of that stuff is probably just by the nature of being politics is not going to happen because it's either too costly or too, too difficult to do or some political pork was traded another way. Mm. So I would say that generally speaking, pretty much everything that was campaigned on is probably going to happen within this year. Um, if it's not, companies are going to influence things and make it so anyway. Yes. So. That's probably what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're going to, you're going to see a lot of ARs kind of fall into lakes. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I I think that the, the the gun control thing is probably going to be very, I think 2020, especially the end of 2020 showed us that when it comes to things like gun control, really the people that were out there screaming the loudest who are saying that this is, the worst possible thing that's going to happen. Even they were kind of underselling it um, when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, because as we know, the whole AR pistol thing, they, uh, you know, found out that, Hey, we're not just going after braces, but the whole pistol itself. So it's like, well, that's not good. Um, yeah. You yeah, had, we'll I, it was funny around here, you know, it's such a liberal place. Um, you had people trying to buy guns it just come to realize like they've either been arrested or like they have, they're not eligible. I'm not eligible. What the hell are you talking about? Like they had no yeah. concept of how hard it really is to get one. Um, yeah. It's, it's not easy. It's oh. not easy to do. And depending and on where you live, it's, it's, you know, damn near impossible sometimes. So yeah, ex- exactly. And the, uh, the old trick of uh, the old argument of going down to home Depot and making one yourself. Well, <laughs> that's, that's not exactly a realistic thing either. So yeah. Unless you have like, two, three, four years of experience doing it. Good luck, man. At an entire machine shop, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Jamie says, can you talk a little bit more about Keybase and uh, what you guys are doing? Yeah, so so Keybase is kind of where we ended up. Um, Keybase is a, it is a decentralized platform. As far as we know, there aren't any servers out there. Mm. It's basically like Discord, um, but it's a little bit less user-friendly. But once you get on it and you start using it for different things, it's uh, it's something. It's a, one of those platforms that's virtually impossible to get rid of. Hmm. Um, it's very hard to get rid of it. Um, we had a Discord server where we had, I think, fourteen hundred or so people in it, and uh, Discord just decided, hey, we uh, we don't want you around anymore. So they deleted everything. But they didn't just delete us. Everybody who had a Discord account, they also deleted their account for wow. um, terrorism. I think it was. Um, so. Yeah, that can't happen with Keybase. Huh. Uh, once you set it up, you get in, you're good to go. Um, but yeah, even Keybase isn't perfect. So we have a very intense communications plan and all different kinds of platforms you can spring to. But I would, I would assume that based on the deplatforming we're seeing right now, 
there are going to be some very good and interesting things come out of the tech world over the next, say, month or so. Yeah, um, and I thought it was interesting that, um, you know, DT was talking about, you know, Donald was talking about um, possibly doing his own thing or maybe even having somebody acquire, um, what is it, <laughs> Facebook or whatever, like, <laughs> no, Twitter. Yeah, I mean, that, was there, yeah. that'd be kind of interesting. Um, I, I don't know how that would work out for him, but, <laughs> you know, one of the things that kind of kept people like us and a lot of people off of places like parlor before they got shut down. The sort of thing that, that kind of made people not go on it was how it seemed to be like a basically conservative sounding room. Meaning if you were not conservative, you weren't really welcome there. Well, I think that as we've seen when parlor got, I don't know, tens of millions of accounts created that sort of even the playing field. And now you have a, it's not so much a sounding room anymore. Well, before it was deleted, but it's more of a, more of a normal type play. So I think that's, what's going to happen is we're going to see a lot of platforms get created for the sole purpose of being a, a political sounding room for whatever ideology, but we're also going to start seeing people have to go somewhere. Social media is part of people's lives. And if you, you know, get rid of half of everybody on Twitter, well, those people, that's what, 80 million people or something like that, they're going to have to go somewhere. So no doubt. And I, I think you're absolutely right about that. Where It's going to be interesting to see what starts to shake out. And I think that these companies are going to start to see a lot of, you know, blowback, so to speak, about what they're doing and how hard they're censoring. And if you really think about it, you know, um, I don't want to say guys like you and me, cause that makes us like sound like whatever, but guys like 40% of the United States are like, like-minded, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, like, yeah, least, exactly. so, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's definitely going to be interesting to see what kind of comes out of the, the, the tech world on this one. That's for sure. sure. Um, because we're starting to see a lot of peer to peer decentralized blockchain based stuff. It's, it's very interesting. Um, people starting to, to be motivated enough to create things that can't ever be shut down. Even if the internet disappears, they'll still be active. So mm. it's very fascinating to follow that stuff. Yeah, that's some fascinating stuff right there as far as all that goes. Um, yeah. So what else do you see? I mean, you guys, number one, I want to just say for any of you out there who haven't already gone and checked out the S2 Underground podcast on YouTube. You're missing out. Um, if you like this type of content, if you like what we put out at Gutter Fighting Secrets with the close protection tactics and all that, you're going to geek out on what these guys are putting out because it's real official, like tradecraft, amazing stuff. Um, number two, if you don't follow S2, go ahead and follow them um, here on Insta. S, what is it? S2 Underground backup it's, now? Uh, yeah, S2 Underground, I think three or four, something like that. If you just search for S2 Underground, you'll find us. Perfect. Um, um, and so, again, on Keybase, sorry, on Keybase as well? Yep, on Keybase as well. Just search for S2 Underground on Keybase, and uh, that'll be where we're at. Cool. So those are the platforms. Um, I'm sure there'll be more in the mix. We're looking, yep. you know, here at getting more in the mix as well. What do you think is going to happen with Parler? You think it's just uh, I I think Parler's probably going to struggle for a while, but I think they or their founders will create something else. If not called Parler, it's going to be called something else, but they'll eventually find a way to, to get back online. I don't know if that data is going to be there still. So I would, I would assume that anybody who had a Parler account, like we had one, I would assume that data is probably gone um, or going to be gone by the time they get a replacement. But I would assume they're probably not, uh, they're not totally gone. They'll be back. I'm sure. Somebody will be. Well, man, I want to uh, wrap it up right now. So let you get, you know, get to your family and everything, but thank you so much for coming on. I know we froze up for a second there on Instagram. Are you still with me? Yeah, I'm still Okay, yep. cool. Yep. Making sure they didn't boot us. All right. So yeah, yeah. no, man, it's, um, dude, it's been a distinct pleasure to, uh, to have you on Jay. And I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. Likewise. It's been fun. So we'll have to do this again sometime. Absolutely. I'll be looking forward to it, man. So, Guys, um, yeah, no, absolutely, dude. So I want to encourage all of you, again, if you don't follow me, go ahead, click that follow button. Um, I've got, obviously, um, gutterfuddingsecrets.com. You can always follow me on that. They can't kick me off that, not yet. Um, 
follow S2 on Instagram, Keybase, YouTube. Uh, and once you get there, he'll give you more platforms as they come along. So for all of you guys, uh, Shadez, Pog, freaking all you guys out there who were commenting and asking questions, thank you so much for coming on. And I'm going to shut up and stop rambling now and just say good night, guys. And please remember that you were your first and last line of defense. Jay, thanks again, man. Appreciate it, man.